Shelby O'Connor is a law student at ANU who plans to work in the environmental law space. She has an interest in how interdisciplinary approaches can aid innovation within the law, especially in relation to climate change and sustainable development. Shelby will also be admitted to practice this October. So we welcome Shelby. Shelby, it's over to you. It's all yours. <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for that intro. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us and attending this webinar. Um, I hope we can have a really dynamic and fruitful discussion about the role that science and law play in the creation of policy and action on climate change and potentially what we as individuals can do as well and what ANU can do and is already doing to enact real policy change. Um, so first, I will briefly introduce our panel. Uh, we have Emeritus Professor Steve Dervis from the Fenner School of Environment and Society, um, who originally trained as an ecologist and a geographer and is now an ANU Public Policy Fellow, um, as well as a Chief Organiser for ANU's response to emergency situations and natural disasters. We have Dr. Anna Greta Hunter from ANU Medical School, who is a physician and cardiologist and has been a vocal contributor to the discussion of climate change and its effect its effects on health and also vulnerable populations and is also an ANU Human Futures Fellow. We have Dr Peter Burnett who is an honorary associate professor at the ANU College of Law. Um, he has worked in a number of senior leadership positions in the Federal Department of the Environment and has worked in national and world heritage law as well as developing Australia's national pollution standards and also um, helping to craft the EPBC Act. And we have the Associate Professor, Dr. Judith Jones from the ANU College of Law, who has, um, whose background is in science and law. Um, and she first began working in gene technology and risk assessment <coughs> and is now focusing more on environmental and planning law and has a particular interest in risk assessment and precautionary approaches in environmental law. So yeah, welcome panel. And thanks for agreeing to make time to discuss these really important issues, um, and especially in such strange and trying circumstances. So I really appreciate, appreciate you guys being here. And so I thought I'd just jump straight in. Um, and I'd really like to hear the panel's view on the role science has had in the past and currently has in the creation of environmental policy and disaster prevention policy. So Steve, I reckon I'm gonna hand all this first one to you. Um, and it would be great if you could also kind of talk about the stark comparison um, that scientific knowledge, how scientific, scientific knowledge has been used when um, the response to, for the bushfire response uh, earlier this year and also like comparing that to how the Australian government's um, approach to the pandemic at the moment and how has scientific knowledge been used in either of those cases and how, how do they compare? Well, I... I I suspect that people would think that science has been less listened to in bushfire and more listened to in COVID, but I think it's a bit more complicated. Um, Australia's fire management is strongly informed by science, uh, particularly through the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC. Um, but we have not taken as seriously as we should some of the warnings of lobby who are very bad fire seasons. Um, the, the most commonly known manifestation of that being a large group of emergency, former emergency leaders issuing a very strong warning. However, the research science interaction with bushfire management is, is stronger than most people would probably think. We were similarly warned about pandemics for quite a long time. And I think if you went back six months ago, um, epidemiologists and others would say that we have not been listened to. Uh, and certainly we did not take those warnings in retrospect as well as we should have. Uh, however, the, the stark contrast is the very front stage of epidemiology and related sciences in our response. You know, I don't think, we, we see leaders stand up with fire, lead, fire managers during a bushfire, but we've never seen anything like the collected leaders of the world, well, most of the sane ones, standing side by side with chief medical officers and other experts to the extent we have now. Yeah. Um, it's, most Australians didn't know we had chief medical officers, let alone dozens of them. So I think there's, in, in the response, there's the, um, probably the, the stark comparison. And yeah, how no. that pans out in future, uh, that will be interesting to see. 
Yeah, no, I completely hear that. And I'd like to bring Anna Greta in on, on this point to continue yeah, that discussion. Yeah. Um, I know that through your work, Anna Greta, with the Commission for Human Futures, you look at the planning and policy concerning existential risks, which is what I take this pandemic and also climate change to be. So please correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you can talk to the current government's approach to planning for these risks, whether there was you know, an adequate approach, an adequate plan, and also their, and if you can talk to their reliance on medical and scientific knowledge and expertise. I'll just uh, follow on from maybe from where Steve started in terms of the science and the, the trusting of science. And, and I actually think about it in terms of the political narrative around this. Um, I think there'd be probably broad consensus that we got ourselves into a rut in terms of the politics of climate change and you know, ridiculous discussions about whether it's real or not. Um, uh, really counter scientific discussions that have become entrenched in that, that narrative. We've always had bushfires was an, an easy narrative for our prime minister in leading up into the bushfire season. Um, I think the pandemic is such a, a unique experience that the, you know, the unprecedented territory that we find ourselves in, that you have to fill that narrative, that policy void with some narrative and the narrative that's, that's easily padding out that space at the moment is the narrative of epidemiology and the, epidemi and the narrative around science and medicine. Um, and I suspect as we watch this pandemic resp policy response evolve, that water becomes murkier. We'll find increasingly dominant voices in other areas that it won't just be about medical science. It'll become uh, a, a more complex policy response. Um, so I, I, to, as, as a segue is the Commission for the Human Future and the, the work that I'm doing with them as part of, part of the ANU Future, Human Futures Fellowship. Um, the, the Commission has a list of 10 existential and catastrophic risks. Um, those ri so the difference between existential and catastrophic risks, pandemics are probably a catastrophic risk, uh, have a significant likelihood of harming a, a volume of society but shouldn't lead to human extinction. Um, the, the catastrophic risks, uh, climate change and nuclear war. Um, and so yeah, in the list of, of 10, and I often forget one or two, um, we've got issues around uh, environmental degradation, so loss of water security, food security, um, contamination of essential resources, climate change, population control, living uh, populations that are beyond the, the um, resources that are available. We've got, so that's the environmental cohort. Then we've got a group of, um, of uh, human behaviour constraints. And so uh, issues around artificial intelligence uh, and war is the other human behavioural constraint. And then the, the final um, element of the discussion from the, the Human Futures Commission is to talk about ideas of delusion. And, and it might be that we can frame it in a more compli complex and appropriate way, which is to think about the way in which we use information, the way in which we digest information. And it leads directly into the pandemic and the, the comments earlier that perhaps public health people who, who would have espoused a need for preparation on pandemics a year ago would have been disregarded. Oh, that's not going to happen to us. It's a really small risk. Why do we need to prepare for it? And so that, that's, that's partly how we would uh, demonstrate the delusional risk, that we, we think it's not going to happen to us. We think it's not going to affect us. And you can see that that has informed our climate change response, I think, in the last 20, 30, 50 years. Yeah, no, great. I was going to ask Peter and Judith to, to come on this as well. Um, do you think the current um, COVID pandemic um, has shifted society's willingness to, to accept swift and strict changes um, to government policy? And do you think that's actually going to make it easier um, in the future uh, for the government to make strict and swift policy changes about climate change? Um, or do you think the two um, crises are too hard to compare, too different to compare, being that climate change is a long-term slow burn issue and the pandemic is immediate and it needs immediate response? So, yeah, Judith and Peter, what do you think? Maybe Peter can start. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Shelby. Well, I think we've certainly seen some uh, dramatic shifts in response to the, the COVID crisis and I've been pleasantly surprised at the extent to which the whole of society has been prepared to accept some, some really quite serious constraints on, on, on their lives. Uh, and there's also been a rise uh, uh, in trust in government, which is a good thing because that had been tracking down over quite a long time and getting to seriously low levels. So there are some very uh, positive signs there, but I think it's really hard to tell. I don't have a crystal ball 
whether whether this kind of uh, responsiveness and the, the, the incredible flexibility that people have shown, whether this is going to translate across into uh, other potential future crises such as climate change, very hard to tell. I, I would hope that it would, and I think it would be worth uh, working on some narratives to try and connect the two and build a build a bridge and for example to build the argument of well we've done a pretty good job of dealing with this crisis while we're at it why don't we deal with a couple of others that might be coming down the road but um but really hard to pick whether whether that's the way it will go yeah no definitely i like that you and anna greta both mentioned narrative and we will get to that in um in a bit i will i will guide us there um judith i'm wondering if you could talk to like what do you think about the role of the individual in promoting and signaling change we've spoken before before we uh started this webinar that during the COVID pandemic we've seen people voluntarily implementing quarantine measures and self-isolation measures for the good of the population and, and for the population's health and do you think we might expect um the same behaviour should be encouraged. The same behaviour, um, uh, where for the need for to to signal the need for policy change, um, and how much power can be within the individual and within the public to, to do so. Um, well, look, sort of on a positive note, we've all Australians have all have have a history of being prepared to voluntarily comply with environmental measures. Uh, you know, so we've got good examples of um, in terms of. Soil conservation and land care, um, very significant program of voluntarism. Um, you know, when there were water restrictions, we've been good at reducing our water use. There are lots of examples of where, you know, we can we have behaved in this way. But for some of the things that end up with a big economic cost or some kind of economic cost for individuals, um, it's been much harder in the past. So those examples I've given have basically been win-wins um, in many instances. And so they have an economic benefit as well as um, the environmental benefit. So whether we're going to be able to take that forward uh, in the face of economic costs, I mean, the history of environmental law shows again and again that economics plays a very big role um, as you know, an important consideration for decision makers at all different levels of government um, and decision making. So um, I'd like to be optimistic. Um, but I think there are some difficulties there that have to be resolved. Yeah, definitely, especially with the impending recession. I think there's a big fear that the momentum behind uh, the move to take action on climate change is going to be limited and it, it might the environment might come second to resource development or agricultural development, which could be a massive issue. Um, I would like to talk about what the panel thinks the role of law is within this space. Um, so maybe Steve and Anna Greta, you know, you both come uh, from science backgrounds. I, I would like, I'd be curious to hear about um, what are your impressions of the role of law in furthering policy and action on climate change? And do you think we can continue on with our current frameworks and institutions, or do you think we need new frameworks altogether? Uh, shall I? Go for it, Steve. Yeah. Um, with having, having worked in well, climate change and particularly emergency management for a long time, the role of law is both less than people think it is and utterly crucial. I mean, it's an essential part of the architecture of how we organise government, how we organise policy. Um, and one of the biggest roles for law is to actually engage with other disciplines and professions to explain the role of law. There's a huge amount of confusion over the role of law in disaster management Often it's seen as a terrible problem when it probably isn't. Uh, most, most statutory arrangements are fairly flexible and discretionary. They allow a fair bit of action. There's, there's a, a reliance on thinking of the law as strict regulation or court cases. And the strict regulation is only very much part of it. The establishment of process um, the inclusion or, or exclusion of particular voices in policy or debates or decisions, um, standard setting and so on. It, it's, a, it's a more subtle array of instruments than I think most people believe it is. And when we talk about climate law, there's, there's a tendency to just think about climate litigation, which uh, is interesting but of, of probably limited import. 
Whereas the, the you know, so I think the role of law is very variable. It's, it's a toolkit rather than a particular tool. And that is not as well understood by many in the community or in professions or in other disciplines. So I think it's, it's in the sense of engagement with policy domains. So I, I'd rather see a, a lawyer with a good understanding of the law, but an interest of law in society than the black letter law where the, the law talks mostly to itself. So that I, that's how I'd like to see the law engage. Okay, that's fair. Anna Greta, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a doctor, so I don't know anything about the law. Um, but I, I guess if we were thinking about how it would help to solve these complex and interdependent problems, the, 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 the opportunity in law is a profound one to provide the, the structure um, and framework that articulates the rationale uh, behind the policies that we all, uh, we need to develop uh, to the, 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 the core elements of policies that are important to us. And I think that's you know, part of the decision-making process for Australia in 2020 and 2021 is about working out where, where the environment lies in terms of our national priority. Um, and perhaps being able to shift beyond a, a short-termism into a, well, a longer-term perspective and recognising the benefits of, of, of having value um, through a legal framework to, to the natural environment um, and to the, the issues that flow with that. Yeah, no. Um, I think building on that, I'll ask Judith um, about your research and also our previous discussions that suggest that you think there should be stronger laws in place to protect the environment and also to protect the citizens who are bringing actions to keep decision makers accountable. So I was hoping that you could expand on that a bit more and, you know, what is it that you think most needs strengthening and why? Well, following on from the comments that Steve made, I mean, the law is simply follows policy. So to get stronger laws, you need stronger policy. And I'm thinking in terms of environmental outcomes, the policy objective can be anything. And the law can reflect whatever that policy objective is. The law simply follows, in terms of passing legislation, simply follows in this country whatever the politicians decide it will be. So if you want stronger laws, you need, you know, um, political will to enact them. Um, I don't know if that answers the question fully. What was the other part of the question that you asked? I was, I was hoping to get to your opinions about the standard of proof or the lack of standard of proof when appraising uh, government decision making on climate change or on environmental issues? Well, the Australian law doesn't provide any particular standard of evidence or proof that's needed for policy formulation or indeed for discretionary decision making by governments in the environmental sector. There's no kind of best available science standard that has to be followed um, in terms of making policy or, or actually administering policy, not, not written into many statutes in the environmental field. You're more likely to find prescriptive standards in the health field to link back to the other part of our discussion. It's more likely that risk assessments that are carried out in the health sector are going to be um, have highest higher um, obligations in relation to the nature of the evidence that's used in order to make decisions or to formulate policy. Um, so um, that doesn't mean to say that I think that the environmental Decision makers are cavalier with science, although I could possibly argue about that in some contexts. But I don't. I think in general, there's good attention paid to science to inform um, the frameworks. But it's you know, science doesn't necessarily drive the decisions in any way that you might. If you were interested in science as an evidence-based decision-making model for making decisions, there's not much in the law that drives that at present. Not in Australian law. Not in the environmental sector anyway. At the moment, there's a problem. Yeah. I expect you'd find more in the health sector. Yeah, and so would you envision a change or a new, some new institutional frameworks to, to change that, that process and to have uh, better standards of proof, easier ways of measuring um, action by decision makers? Well, the, the Australian law doesn't actually provide... If, if you're going to review what an administrative decision maker does, um, you need the courts to do it, and the courts are deferential to the standards of information that our decision makers use. The courts won't interfere. We have a separation of powers in our parliamentary system and um, the, the courts won't interfere. So the courts are deferential to the manner in which decisions are made by the executive. Uh, and this is facilitated in the environmental sphere by having um, broad discretions, as Steve mentioned. They have the opportunity to consider 
matters of science and environmental effect, as well as economic matters and as well as social considerations. So the decision, decision makers have this discretionary power and the courts won't interfere with that um, readily, to put it simply. Okay, no, that's fair. Thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if we could switch to talking about the private members bill that Zali Stegall um, has put forth and aims to implement a UK model or style of approach to tackling climate change. Um, so that seems to suggest that we do need new ways and new processes to deal with um, the consequences of climate change. Um, so I was hoping that, Peter, you might be able to explain um, what this private, member, uh, private members bill is about, whether you think the UK model would be a good fit for our frameworks in Australia at the moment, um, and you know whether or not you actually think this bill would pass and if it will be successful. Yes, um, thanks, Shelby. And can I lead into this by saying, connecting it back to the previous comments, I think the, the, uh, the UK Climate Change uh, Act of 2008, which is the one that uh, Sally Stegall is largely proposing to um, copy in her private member's bill here, is a great, in a, a great example of uh, innovation and Steve's point about law as a toolkit, um, because certainly in, in our legal framework, the sort of the, um, the English common law system, I, I don't know of, of anything quite like it. And I think it's very clever uh, in the way that it brings together uh, not only law and science, but other expert advice as well. So the, the, the UK model is that it's set up uh, an independent uh, expert body called the Climate Change Committee to um, uh, provide advice to the government against the backdrop of a statutory um, um, goal or objective of originally um, a reduction of 80% uh, emissions by 2050, but they amended it last year and they've gone for the net net zero. So you've got a, a statutory goal, an obligation on the, the government to achieve that goal, and then an independent um, statutory body, this climate change uh, committee, to provide the expert advice to do the risk assessment um, and provide the government with the the inputs that it that it needs, you know, what what do you need to try and achieve, and then a framework, which involves the the series of uh, a rolling five year um, emissions um, uh, budgets, carbon budgets, and I think this is this is a great system because you have uh, the budget for for the current period, and then it has two forward periods, and so the the government at any given time is required to be. Um, meeting the carbon budget for the current period and to have two sets of carbon budgets out there for two, two forward periods, so effectively um, 10 years plus out. And I think that's a, that's a great way of doing policy because uh, it's science-based. Uh, it's, it's got, a, it, by working in five-year timeframes, you've got a, a workable period because it's very hard to see um, a long way into the future in terms of working out what's realistic uh, and the capacity to keep updating those, but also these forward budgets. It's a bit like the forward estimates in parliamentary processes. It gives people a sense of where things are going, enables them to, to make decisions um, based on reasonable expectations about what's gonna happen in the future, but it's not locked in, um, in concrete. Uh, it can be uh, updated as, as you go along. So I think it's, uh, uh, and then they have a review process as well and processes to, to adjust. So I think that's been a great model. I don't know quite where it came from, um, but, but it was developed uh, in the UK uh, and the Zali Stegall bill proposes largely that we adopt it. Uh, she's also looked at some uh, legal frameworks from, from other countries. She's been influenced by some of the European models as well. But when you look at her bill, it's pretty close to the, the UK model. Um, and one reason I'm, I'm keen on it is that I think we need some way to break the impasse. We've had a climate policy impasse in Australia for a, a long time now. And now, now maybe some of that breaking of the impasse might come from the current crisis with the the COVID-19, as we were talking before, will it change people's attitudes and 
increase their uh, appetite perhaps to, to deal with this kind of um, uh, high, uh, high risk but low probability uh, event. But we also need sort of innovative mechanisms. We need things that people might be able to latch onto and say, yeah, let's, let's, let's work on this. This is a good approach. And so we've had this impasse uh, in Australian politics and here's, here's a model that might work. It's been put up by somebody who's uh, new on the scene. I think it's quite an impressive uh, effort. And perhaps with the, the way that the COVID-19 crisis has shaken things up, perhaps there might be a willingness to, um, to, to look at options like this because we, we do need a way forward at the moment. We're, um, we're not making a lot of progress, are we? Yes, Steve, I'm wondering what you think. Look, I, I'd, I'd agree with Peter on that. I think, I think that is part of the role of law through legislation is to establish a process. It's not the only part of that. You need the politics, the science and the, the community engagement. But for the long term, if we can not remove the power of successive governments, but to put in a robust process over time, that is one way of breaking the impasse of improving trust and seeing some predictability in policy, uh, none of which we've seen with climate policy over the last 10, 20 years. And often we hear why we don't cope with climate change is because it's a long-term problem. But our political uh, and other systems have been able to do long-term problems before. It's not impossible. Uh, universal superannuation, defence procurement, infrastructure planning, there are things that we do with decadal spans underpinned by a, a robust system. So that's the attraction of the model in the bill, is that it does not remove the power of elected governments, which we should not ever do, by the way, but it moderates that through a long-term, a robust and well-informed process. So, you know, it, it is, it would be a, we've heard game changer far too often in recent days and, and times, and I don't want to sound like Donald Trump. It could be, it could be a game changer in terms of bipartisan or multipartisan support if people can think that they can trust that model to guide us steadily but purposefully down a path. And having that ensconced in legislation would, of course, be absolutely necessary. Yeah, no, definitely. And as a game changer, we can hopefully come back to the narrative um, discussion we were having previously. Will this bill, will this model potentially be a game changer for us to create a new narrative, a new meta-narrative, in order to shape the direction Australia wants to go in 2020 um, into 2030 for like a uh, zero carbon emission target. Uh, so I'm wondering what the panel thinks with that. Do we want to start with Anna Greta or Peter, Judith? Uh, look, I think that's part of the challenge of the, the, um, the of where we're at in 2020. We've co come through six months of uh, extraordinary, uh, I'm going to describe as, as dystopian. We've been through uh, apocalyptic uh, circumstances, particularly here um, in Canberra, looking out the windows, dealing with smoke, dealing with fire, dealing with trauma, and then dealing with coronavirus. Um, we need narrative disruption, and and I think we need to really begin to significantly shape, uh, to shift the way that our, our, our public policy is developed. Um, I think the bushfire experience is a beautiful example of the need for change. I think the coronavirus uh, pandemic has shown us some of the mechanisms of change. I think that we have never had an opportunity for change like we're faced with right now. Um, and so if I just draw briefly on some of the, the ideas that have come from the first round table report for the Commission for the Human Future, um, really dominant themes of using science and evidence and thinking about an inclusive approach to information, um, using uh, thinking about how to get good representation across a diversity of population, making sure that ideas of justice and representation uh, are in integrated into all of our policy response and trying to shift significantly from a short-termism uh, focus to a longer-term gain. Um, part of the reason to put forward a model of existential and catastrophic risks is to recognise the interdependence. And again, I think we see this nicely demonstrated through coronavirus, that some of the things that we're doing in coronavirus response have flow-on effects, often through economic mechanisms, into carbon pollution. 
Um, and they're both often positive and negative feedback loops. But a, a being able to appreciate the interdependence of these serious risks that will, that will potentially impact on our human future and the synergistic benefits of action on each one of these risks, uh, which potentially improves our human future. So I think we're in an extraordinary time where we see transformative change is underway and we've got an opportunity to shape the narrative like we've never had before. Okay, Diana, I'd, I'd like to, to send this question to Peter as well, you know, knowing that your background is in environmental law and heritage law. Um, how important is it that we do reshape the current narrative of endless growth model, which is what, what it seems like to me, um, in order to actually enact real change? Well, how significant is it? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's very important. And, and you mentioned my, my time in heritage, one of the things that I learned from my time in heritage is, is the importance of narrative, that the, 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 the narrative that's associated with something that's important to us, for example, a historic building is, is um, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's not just about the, um, the building or the, the thing that's precious. It's about the story that, that, that goes with it. And I think the shift that we need to make in our current narrative is to bring in the sense of nature has nature has its limits. We've got to got to live within our environmental means. Um, it's only in the last um, fifty years or so that, as a human race, that we've come up against these limits. And I think we're still um, fighting against the realization that nature does does have, have its limits, and also coming to an understanding of what those limits imply. But, but I think the basis of a, of a narrative going forward is that we do have to live within our environmental means. We have to uh, respect nature and work within nature's limits because nature doesn't negotiate. Unlike a lot of other political issues, it's not a negotiation. There can't be compromise. Nature only provides us with a certain level of services and um, that's it. We've got, we've got to make do with, um, with what nature provides. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that we do actually have to wrap up now in the interest of time and for the Q&A, but I think that's a good place to leave it as well. It feels a bit positive, but also there's definitely more work to be done, definitely. So, yeah, handing over to Mike. Hey, um, that was a really great question, guys. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a few questions now. Unfortunately, given the time constraints, we won't be able to get through all of them. However, um, I'll just try to get through as much as I can. Um, the first one here is for any of the panelists, um, feel free to jump in. Is there any impact of ur urbanization on climate change and pandemics, especially for developing countries where most people who are originally from rural areas migrate to urban areas to find jobs? Anyone want to take that on? Not qualified as an epidemiologist to comment. Yeah, I think that's a bit, bit beyond my expertise, Mike. I think we're still actually trying to map the epidemiology around coronavirus. I don't think we fully understand those variables as yet. Um, but we know that, that cities have their positives and negatives in terms of the health effects of people living in cities. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not, not my, my area of expertise either. So. All right, another one that came in. What steps and strategies can the experts recommend to bridge the significant gap that exists between the willingness of politicians to accept the opinion of ex experts in relation to the pandemics and historic lack of acceptance, mainly by politicians, of the opinions of experts on climate change? Look, I, I'll make an observation on that. And a clear one is that the, the pandemic, although we ignored early warnings, we've relied very strongly on scientific expertise in the response, is that the, the stakes are immediate and very personal in terms of public health and economic impacts and employment impacts. Climate change is a future impact by and large, although the last fire season is a fairly good warning. Uh, I, I think we've, about 30 years ago, we pigeonholed climate change in a lot of people's minds as an environmental issue. It was, it was first, well, it was actually first advanced by scientists, but 
it was environmental groups, green parties and so on, who were early advocates. And it fell into a, it's that issue versus the economy and so on. It could have been framed as an economic and public health issue. Mm-hmm. And I think the the response and the, the narrative and the, and the perception of it and the willingness to listen to the dire warnings of scientists may have been quite different had it been framed that way. So maybe, in fact, we need to get more doctors speaking about climate change. That you know, you've got a fairly universal chorus from the medical profession for, for consistent action on coronavirus. Um, and whilst there's some some significant voices in the medical profession talking about climate change, and that voice is growing, uh, maybe as we see increasing numbers of professionals come forward and speak uh, with passion and with um, with science about the need for action on climate change, we'll actually potentially shift that. Um, I think this is where the narrative comes in again too. I mean, the, what the question's driving on is really it's it's the really hard bit, isn't it? How how do we get um, uh, the science talking to the politics when when we've got these really long term issues and the gap between the discussion of the issue now and the and uh, and the the benefits of any decisions we take are, are down the track. So you're trying to bridge this this um, policy and generational gap. It's it's very hard to do. But if I come back to to narrative, um, people. Uh, don't respond very well to negative news all the time. So I think one of one of the things we can try and do is to build positive narratives. It's about how how we can um, uh, create a better future by addressing these problems now. I mean, I know it's re- it's really just flipping the thing around rather than saying you face these um, terrible impacts down the track. You, you create a positive narrative about how we can avoid them if we do certain things now. So. There's no easy answer to this this problem, but I do think there's an important role for po- positive narratives uh, in dealing with it. And if I can just add in, I think also that with the appearance of solutions to some of the obstacles, then you can see very rapid change in terms of uptake by politicians and therefore the law in making changes. So there's a number of examples historically where there were apparent obstacles, you know, with those underpinning substances, and there was a technological solution. Um, you know, there was a lot of warnings about soil degradation well before the Soil Conservation Act was enacted, but then they had some solutions that were presented um, such that they had available, and then there was, you know, legislation and uptake. So I think as more solutions present with renewable energy and so on, I think we might see more rapid progress. That would be another component. And that's another example of a positive narrative, isn't it, that the, the, the opportunities... Uh, presented by renewable energy for the economy versus we've got to do this because we face disaster. Cool. Um, Another question that we have is, sorry, what's the panel's view on a looming Franklin Dam moment where law policy and societal will combine to force major change? As we've, can, I t- can I start with this one? As, as we've been thinking, um, I've been thinking a lot about this interaction between um, social change and legal change. You know, so there is, I think, it hasn't been studied enough, but an iterative process between incremental social change and incremental legal change. So um, which, whether there's going to be a Franklin Dam moment or not is a really good question. Um, but those sorts of, um, you, can get, if you, get, you can get legal change that causes a spill of social change. Um, which then is an iterative process moving forward. So, I mean, I don't know when we're going to get it, but and maybe maybe where we are is is part of that process. It's a very good question. I don't think lawyers and social scientists study that nexus enough. Could I? I, I think uh, some people thought or hoped that the uh, recent bushfire season, uh, on top of uh, lack of water inflows and the previous two and ongoing drought, could have been such a, a moment of, um, my God, this is serious. Uh, that has somewhat faded with COVID-19, um, you know, and very understandably so. But the Franklin Dam moment, if you look at the what it resulted in, apart from that particular site being protected, the Commonwealth powers that were seen as revolutionary at the time have been scarcely used uh, since then. 
So we had a social and legal moment, but its its long term uh, impact was not as much as people thought when the court handed down its decision back in the early eighties. The the Commonwealth has been loath to utilise its world heritage powers over states who may be of the same political persuasion or it may have been politically unpopular. So the legal change there, I don't think, was quite as revolutionary as, as people hoped at the time or thought at the time. Mm. All right. So um, I, um, I think we have time for one last question. I'll just throw this to the group. Who do you think should shape and communicate the narrative? Is it a group effort? And if so, how should this be coordinated? I think you're looking for um, uh, policy entrepreneurs here. I don't think there's any, well, perhaps the obvious answer is um, in an ideal world, um, leaders in government would shape the narrative, um, but that, that the narratives don't always come come from government, um, and in the policy literature, it talks about um, policy entrepreneurs. You get um, people who emerge, and and maybe Zali Stegel is one. I don't know. Um, in the um, uh, development of this, the Climate Change Act in the UK, um, the person who who changed the merit the the narrative was. Uh, David Cameron, who was elected uh, as leader of the, the Conservative Party, was then in opposition, and he came in and said, I think the Conservative Party is um, um, distinctly unattractive in certain respects, and I'm going to change it, and he picked on environment, and he came up with this line of um, uh, go green, vote blue, uh, and and he he changed the political narrative in the UK and environment became much more of a um, bipartisan issue. So it's it's often very hard to say who the um, who the tellers of the story will be. Often they just, just emerge, and I think David Cameron's a good example there. Kurt, there was another question which talked about um, local and state level action as opposed to national, and that I think is where we're seeing some of the narrative change, or at least models and leadership. And I think the question mentioned California in comparison to the national level at US. And in Australia, we've had some regional organisations of councils do really leading work on climate adaptation. Um, I'd pick out South Australia and the ACT on mitigation and renewables and some private sector firms who have really pushed ahead. So there's a lot of advances being made. And I think a lot of looking at those models to see how that goes. You know, do the, do the councils do well? Do the, do the jurisdictions go broke? Do the firms prosper? So there's, there's all sorts of um, good examples and experiments out there. Pulling those together to a coherent story, I think, in the, in the midst of usually a lot of bipartisan argument is probably where, where the leadership and the entrepreneurship can come from of connecting the various experiments. That's a microgrid model that I've been thinking about for a little while. I, I think the fascinating part of the policy and politics uh, at the moment is thinking about things on a ro on a local level, uh, really going to, to a microcosm viewpoint. Um, and you actually see it in the health response to climate change that that uh, as with the summer that we've just experienced with heat and with water restrictions and with bushfire smoke, that in fact, taking care of each other in our local communities was actually a really important part of surviving uh, really difficult and adver adverse circumstances. Um, and so working together locally is a good survival technique. It's also a good political technique and it's a good technique for shifting policy. Um, and you see it uh, it's through the perhaps over-analyzed federal seat of Indi, uh, but thinking about how to encourage local communities to really find their voice and find find a representation which reflects the needs and concerns of a local community and engaging people in that conversation. Um, and it's, it's one of the things I'm really keen at the moment is to, to make sure that as many people as we can around the country have confidence to engage in this conversation, this conversation about how the future is shaped affects all of us it's something into which all of us should contribute. And so mechanisms that facilitate that um, are likely to be on a local local basis. All right, thanks for that. I 
think we are just over time. I think we've had a really great discussion, really informative, um, lots of great questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but yeah, like Tammy mentioned at the start, um, this recording, this webinar will what was being recorded. So please feel free to jump back in if you want to review it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone, um, the panelists. Um, awesome discussion, guys. Thanks for your time. Um, I'd also like to thank Shelby for sharing her time with us um, as our moderator. Um, it was a re um, I think I think it was a really um, good discussion. And um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a wrap for us. Thanks, Thank Bobby. Great work. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you very much. Bye.